Welcome to the 2019 Annual Meeting of the American Academy of Neurology in Philadelphia. The world's, this is the world's largest gathering of neurolog neurologists and neuroscience professionals. My name is Andrew Imholt and I'll be moderating today's press conference. We're joined by members of the press here in attendance at the annual meeting and by conference call. Today, we welcome Dr. Dr. Tamara Pringsheim and Dr. John Piacentini, authors of the American Academy of Neurology's new guideline, Treatment of Ticks in People with Tourette's Syndrome and Chronic Tick Disorders. The guideline is endorsed by the Child Neurology Society and the European Academy of Neurology. The research will be published today at noon Eastern Time in the online edition of Neurology, the medical journal of the American Academy of Neurology, and is strictly embargoed until noon Eastern Time today, Monday, May 6th. It will also be published in the Tuesday, May 7th, 2019 print edition of Neurology. Dr. Tamara Pringsheim is an associate professor with the Department of Clinical Neurosciences, Psychi Psychiatry, or excuse me, Psychiatry, Pediatrics, and Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary. She is the program lead for the Tourette and Pediatric Movement Disorder Program at the Alberta Children's Hospital and the Deputy Director of the Matheson Center for Mental Health Research and Education. She also serves as an evidence-based method excuse me, evidence-based medicine methodologist for the American Academy of Neurology. Dr. John Piacentini is a professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and the UCLA Seminole Institute, Seminole Institute where he directs the Tourette Association Center of Excellence, Child OCD, Anxiety and Tick Disorders Program, and the Center for Child Anxiety, Resilience, Education, and Support. As chair of the Tourette Association of America's Behavioral Science Consortium, he played a key role in the development of the comprehensive behavioral intervention of, for ticks and has trained hundreds of clinicians in its use. After our authors present today, we will take questions first by those in attendance in Philadelphia and then from the journalists on the phone. Please remember to identify yourself and your media outlet when asking your question. Just as a reminder, there is an embargo on, the, on today's presentation of noon Eastern Time today, Monday, May 6th, 2019. Welcome, Dr. Springsheim and Dr. Piacentini. Thank you, Mr. Imholt. For people living with Tourette syndrome and other chronic tick disorders, an accurate diagnosis, ongoing medical assessment of the severity of ticks as well as treatments that include holistic care, behavioral strategies, and medications based on the latest scientific evidence could mean a better chance of managing ticks over time. The American Academy of Neurology's new guideline on the treatment of ticks in people with Tourette syndrome and chronic tick disorder is being published in Neurology. It is endorsed by the Child Neurology Society and the European Academy of Neurology. Ticks are repetitive movements and vocalizations prompted by an irresistible urge to produce them. They are the defining feature of Tourette's syndrome, which is a neurodevelopmental disorder that begins in childhood. Tourette's syndrome and other chronic disorders affect 200,000 Americans. The goal of this guideline is to offer guidance to physicians on treatments and steps in assessing and counseling patients with chronic tick disorders when looking at treatment options. For the guideline, authors reviewed all available evidence. They recommend that when a person has tics that are not causing physical impairment, pain, emotional distress, or social embarrassment, that watching and waiting is an acceptable management strategy when also combined with providing education that helps the person understand and better cope with the disorder. Treatment must be individualized and based on a collaborative decision among the patient, their caregivers, and their doctor. The guideline also recommends that doctors tell children with, with ticks and their caregivers that there is a good chance that their symptoms will improve in late adolescence. If symptoms affect a person's daily life, the guideline recommends that doctors first consider prescribing comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks. This treatment combines habit reversal training which teaches patients how to control their urges to tick, 
with other behavioral strategies to reduce stress and other factors that often make tics worse. It's also common for people with tic disorders to have neurodevelopmental and psychiatric conditions. The guideline recommends that people with tics are evaluated for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and mood and anxiety disorders, since treatment for these disorders may also be needed. In some cases, one medication can help lessen the symptoms of both a tic disorder and a coexisting disorder. Medications discussed in the guideline for the treatment of tics include alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, antipsychotic medications, topiramate, and botulinum toxin. Medications may be prescribed when the benefits are greater than the risks. It is important that people with Tourette syndrome and other chronic tic disorders are informed of all available treatment options. Thank you, Drs. Pringsheim and Dr. Piacentini. We will now take questions from reporters in attendance. Oh, John, just hold on one second. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Thank there. you. Um, John Giever, MedPage Today. Uh, so uh, what is the point at which uh, you, uh, um, I want, don't want to say give up on CBIT because I'm sure you don't do that, but when do you introduce the medications? What, you know, uh, how is that clinical decision made? Um, well, we, we like to start with CBIT um, if it's available, and we, um, it's, it's typically um, um, uh, runs about 8 to 12 weeks of treatment and before we can see the results that we're looking for. So if a patient is unable to do CBIT because of, say, co-occurring co ADHD or anxiety or depression or something that might interfere with their ability to do the treatment, we would consider medication relatively earlier, maybe even as a first-line treatment. Clearly with ADHD, we, we would want to get the ADHD symptoms under control before starting mm -hmm. CBIT. If we're doing CBIT absent these other conditions, um, we would probably give it at least four to six weeks before we would consider medication. Thank you. Right up here. Have uh, Dan Keller, Rularta, have there been guidelines in this area before, and if so, what's new? So they, these are the first uh, guidelines for American neurologists on the treatment of tics and Tourette syndrome. There have been Canadian guidelines, um, as well as guidelines for, for psychiatrists, which were published in 2013. There's also European guidelines, which were published in 2011, but this is the first time the American Academy of Neurology has put out a practice statement for neurologists. In terms of what's new, um, you know, uh, Tourette syndrome uh, is, is a fairly common disorder in that uh, about 1% of, of, of children are affected, but many of them don't require medical treatment. So uh, the research in terms of trials moves I'd, at, I'd say, a slower pace compared to other neurological disorders like Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, where you see dozens and dozens of trials published uh, you know, every few years. Um, I'd say that the thing that we want to convey with this guidelines is the importance of the comprehensive behavioral intervention as a treatment strategy, so that more neurologists are aware of it. Um, you know, as as physicians, we're used to prescribing medications or or, or medical interventions rather than uh, behavioral therapies, and so we really wanted to uh, bring this awareness uh, to neurologists that they should be recommending this treatment. Is that different? In the Canadian guidelines, uh, the comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics is also strongly recommended as a first-line treatment, as well as in the European guidelines. Hi, I'm Susan Jeffrey from um, Medscape Neurology. Um, you talk about CBIT, about the if available or if accessible. Is there an issue with the accessibility to it? And you also mentioned uh, telemedicine maybe being an option? Well, CBIT um, is, is actually relatively new. I mean, behavioral strategies of different sorts have been around um, for, for decades. Um, but the original um, CBIT um, studies, um, efficacy trials were pu only published about um, within the last 10 years. So um, 
there have been, um, there, there not, not all, not that many providers are, let me take that back. Um, we need more providers trained. There are a number of providers, the number is growing pretty dramatically, working with the Tourette Association. We have a behavior therapy um, treatment um, institute that we are trying to train people. This uh, CDC sponsors some work in this area. So, um, but, but there are a lot of areas of the country that just don't have easy access to these therapists. And for the therapists that do the work, um, oftentimes they can be pretty full because Tourette's is, is a relatively common disorder. So we're working on this, on this issue and we're hoping over the coming decade we'll be able to get the number of therapists up. Uh, hi, Ann Sidor from Practical Neurology. Uh, first of all, thank you for preparing the guideline. It's clearly an unmet need for neurologists in the U.S and for children and families who are dealing with Tourette's and tics. Um, so I think it's, it's great to have a guideline. I know that all of the Academy guidelines have fact sheets for healthcare consumers, which is a wonderful thing the Academy does. What, um, what guidance can you give parents who don't think their kids need you know, psychologic therapy mm -hmm. um, and are you know, worried about the stigma of that? Uh, and also, what guidance can you give to parents um, who are worried about giving their children medications that might change their, uh, their brain over time and the neurodevelopmental issues of, of medication? So I think that a lot of comfort can be given to parents and families just by uh, telling them about the natural history of tic disorders. So if we look over the life cycle, tics usually start between five and six, reach a peak in severity between, between 10 and 12, and then improve for many people, not everyone, but for many people between 14 and 17. So if you look at, uh, if you look at adolescents o older than 16, only about 25% of those children will continue to have moderate to severe tics in adulthood. So your odds are, are, are good that things will improve with time. And so I, I tell the, the children and families that, I, that come to see me that you know, right now you, there may not be any need for treatment, that we can watch and wait, and I'm gonna keep an eye on you, your parents are gonna keep an eye on you, and if your tics start to bother you, so interfere with your daily activities, cause pain or embarrassment, then you just come right back and we can, we can try the, the treatment that you're most comfortable with, whether that's the CBIT uh, or medication. I find that most families would prefer to start with CBIT uh, if, they, if they can, if their child is capable of doing it. Um, sorry, there's two parts to your question. What was the second part? I think uh, in addition to the stigma of mm -hmm. psychological therapy, some families uh, are concerned about the Neuroactive yes. Because it might change well, I don't think we have a lot of evidence that that will happen. Um, I mean, I know there's not a lot of long-term studies, um, but usually the medications don't need to be taken long-term. I'd say in the majority of people, I'm, obviously there are exceptions to every rule, um, but I tell people that hopefully this medication is going to get you through a difficult time and then we're going to re continuously reevaluate it because we know that things get better with time. So it's possible that we'll be able to take you off the medication and we'll often periodically try to do this. Yeah, if, I can, if I can just make a comment as well. I mean, the, the behavior therapy, CBIT, um, Comprehensive Behavioral um, Intervention, is also relatively short term and it, and it really is skills based. So mm -hmm. unlike more traditional mm -hmm. therapy or insight oriented therapy, um, this is a very different, it's, it's really teaching skills for mm -hmm. managing for managing tics. And when we talk to parents, I think education, the guidelines will spur a lot of, uh, hopefully a lot of uh, increased awareness and, and knowledge about tics. Um, and the idea is to really work with families to understand the risks of treatment versus the risks of not treating. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, if um, there's the risk of not treating is, is small, then that's fine. If the risk of not treating is larger, then um, it's up to, I think, the clinicians to really work with parents to understand um, mm -hmm. what's in the best interest of the child. Ultimately, it is the parent's decision. Sometimes we'll see 
uh, cases where um, you know a child is trying so hard to hold in their tics um, that they'll become uh, socially anxious, depressed, um, and you know I, I've seen that happen time and time again. Um, so I, I totally agree with John that there is there can be a consequence to not providing treatment. conference has been unmuted. Uh, we will now take questions from those press that may be attending via conference phone. The conference has been muted. Hearing none, we want to thank Dr. Pringsheim and Dr. Piacentini. On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology, I'd like to thank you and the members of the media for attending. For more information about the American Academy of Neurology's guideline on treatment of tics in people with Tourette syndrome and chronic tic disorders, please visit aan.com. That's aan.com. For the American Academy of Neurology, I'm Andrew Imholt. Thank you.